hi guys you are all welcome to my youtube channel on this youtube channel i am expecting to share my knowledge that i have collected in my studies and in my day-to-day -day life with you all in this special video i am going to explain to you all about the asian ways of using the pen to get connected to your inner spiritual guide to get relevant answers and direction to your life that will be helpful to your future life. The teachings of this video I have extracted from the book of Candlelight that was written in 1987 by the writer of, of Tilopsa Pranka Rampa. By following these teachings of Tilopsa Rampa, you will be able to have the knowledge how to use the pendulum to find treasures missing persons, missing things, and how to get answers for your real inner spiritual guide. Let's see from Rilopsa Pranke how to use the pendulums in correct ways. have become increasingly interested in dowsing and pendulums. There is a letter here from a person who saw a man talking across a field, and suddenly the fork stick which the man was holding twitched violently. The correspondent tells me that this person was a water diviner, and please would I say if there is anything in this business of dowsing and using a pendulum. Yes, most definitely dowsing is a genuine thing if one knows how to use the hazel or other fork twig. Most definitely there is something in pendulums provided the person knows what he is or she is doing and is not just putting on a stage turn to impress the unwary. First, we have to know what causes these things to work. At the present time with radio commonplace it is not at all difficult to get over the idea that there are certain currents, or certain waves, which a person cannot detect without some intermediary. For example, about us all the time is a horrible commotion which, Fortunately, we cannot hear, but radio waves are coming in from everywhere AM, FM, long waves, short waves, high frequency, and ultra high frequency. To the average human they might just as well not be there because without special apparatus or special conditions 12 one just cannot perceive them. But let us get a mysterious piece of equipment between the incoming waves and the loudspeaker or the television tube, and then we get noise or we get pictures. The mysterious piece of apparatus is connected usually to some substance, the aerial, which receives the incoming waves and then takes them to the interior of the mysterious box where all sorts of wires, bits of copper and mica or paper, etc., sort out the jumble and detect a coherent signal. Then it passes on to another section of the box where it is amplified and its speed of frequency is reduced to that which can be dealt with. From the amplifier it goes to the output stage, and thence on to the speaker or to a television tube and speaker, and then we get something which approximates more or less to the original noise which was broadcast, or to the original picture which was broadcast. Of course, that is oversimplifying rather dreadfully because in addition to having the incoming signals we have to have a method of collecting the signals, detecting the signals, amplifying them, and putting them to output. But and we must not forget this we have to have a method of tuning to the frequency or wavelength to which we desire to listen or watch. Radio and dowsing are very much the same. The signals we receive in dowsing let's forget all about dowsing, shall we? Actually, unless a person is going to douse for water only out in the blue yonder there is no point in having hazel twigs, aluminium twigs, or all sorts of wonderful glorified versions of hazel twigs. It is much better and much more convenient to use a pendulum which does everything a dowsing rod can do, and much more. So let us just refer to pendulums because, unless you are a farmer in the wildest part of Australia where you can perhaps cut a suitable twig at any moment, there is no point in cluttering yourself with a lot of lumber. A pendulum is a lump of material attached to something which will not constrict its movements. A little later we will discuss different types of pendulums, but basically the radiations which can be indicated by a pendulum are radiations in some way similar to radio. They are radiations transmitted by all and every material as it decomposes, 
or gets ready to change their teen state. We know, for example, that throughout countless years radium decays into lead. We know that all matter is a whole horde of molecules hopping about like fleas on a hot plate, the smaller the fleas the faster they can jump, the bigger the fleas the slower and more cumbersome. So it is with material. Everything has its atomic number, number of atoms indicating how slowly it is going to vibrate, or how fast it is going to vibrate. So all we do in pendulum work is to tune into some atomic vibrations, and, if we know how, we can tell which one it is and where it is. When we are dealing with radio we have an aerial system which absorbs or attracts or intercepts, call it what you like, the waves coming through the atmosphere. Perhaps they are bounced back by the Heaviside layer or the Appleton layer. But in addition there is a ground wire which makes contact with the ground wave because you must have two positive and negative in everything. You can take the ground wave as negative and the air wave as positive. So in the matter of pendulums the human body collects the air wave, acting as the antenna or aerial, and the feet in contact with the ground act as the earth connection, or ground. And for correct pendulum work it is necessary to keep the balls of the feet on the ground unless one uses another method of tapping the earth current. Of course, using a pendulum is simplicity itself. It is even simpler than simplicity if we know why a thing works. That is why you are getting this long collection of words which might at first strike you as rigmarole, it's not. Until you know what you are doing you can't tell when you are doing it. Pendulums really work. Many Japanese tell the sex of unborn babies by the use of a pendulum. They use a gold ring suspended on a piece of string or thread, and it is held above the stomach of the pregnant woman. The direction or type of movement indicates the sex of the child yet to be born. Incidentally, many Chinese and Japanese use a pendulum for sexing eggs. A radio set uses electric current for reproducing sound which was broadcast from some distant station. Television sets use current also for reproducing a rough simulacrum of the picture transmitted from a distant station. So in the same way 14 if we are going to douse or use a pendulum or anything else we have first of all to have a source of current, and the best source of current we can use is the human body. After all, our brains are really storage batteries, telephone exchanges and all that sort of thing, but the main thing is, it is a source of electric current sufficient for all our needs and sufficient to enable us to detect impulses and thereby cause a pendulum to twitch, swirl, gyrate, or oscillate, or all the other queer thing which a pendulum does. So, to work a pendulum, we must have a human body, an alive human body at that. You cannot tie a pendulum to a hook and expect it to work because there would be no source of current. Nor would it be of much use if we could tie our pendulum to a hook and supply it with current because the current has to be in pulses varying according to the type of action desired. Just as in radio we have high notes, low notes, loud notes, and soft notes, so with a pendulum we must have the necessary current variation to do the necessary. Who is going to vary the current? Well, the over-self, of course. That is the brightest citizen we have around us, you know. After all, you who read this are just one-tenth conscious, so, knowing yourself, just think how brilliant you would be if you could call in the other nine-tenths of consciousness. You can certainly enlist its aid, the aid of the subconscious. The subconscious is brilliant, it knows everything that you have ever known, can do everything that you could ever do, and can remember every single incident since long before you were born. So if you could touch your subconscious you would get to know a very considerable amount of things, wouldn't you? You can touch your subconscious with practice and with confidence. The subconscious can also contact other subconscious minds. There are truthfully no limits to the powers of the subconscious mind and when the subconscious mind is allied to other subconscious minds, then indeed results may be achieved. We cannot just ring up a telephone number and ask to speak to our subconscious because we have to look upon that mind as being something like a very absent-minded professor who is 15 constantly sorting knowledge, storing knowledge, and acquiring knowledge. He is so busy that he can't bother with other people. If you pester him enough in the politest way, then he may answer your summons. 
So first of all you have to become familiar with your subconscious. You see, the whole thing is that the subconscious is the greater part of you, the much greater part of you, and I suggest that you give your subconscious a name. Call him or her whatever you like so long as it is a name agreeable to you. Supposing it is a male, then you could, purely as an illustration, use the name George. Or if it is the subconscious of a female, then you could say Georgina. But the whole point is that you must have some definite name which you link inseparably with your subconscious. So when you want to get in touch with your subconscious you could say for example, George, George, I want your help very much, I want you to work with me, I want you to, here you specify what you want, and remember, George, that really we are all one and what you do for me you are also doing for yourself. You need to repeat that slowly and carefully, and with very great thought. Repeat it three times. The first time George will probably shrug his mental shoulders and say, Oh that pestiferous fellow, bothering me again when I've got so much work to do, and he will turn back to his work. Next time you repeat it he will pay more attention because he is being bothered, but still he won't take any action. But if you repeat it a third time, George, or Peter or Dave or Bill or whoever it is will get the idea that you are going to keep on until you get some action, so he will give a metaphorical sigh and help. This is not fantasy, it's fact. I claim to know quite a lot about it because for more years than I care to remember I have done just this. My own subconscious is not called George, by the way, but a name which I do not reveal to anyone else just as you should not reveal to anyone else the name of your subconscious. I never laugh or joke about it because this is deadly serious. You are only one-tenth of a person, your subconscious is nine-tenths, so you have to show respect, you have to show affection, you have to show that you can be trusted because if you do not gain the cooperation of your subconscious then 16 you won't do any of the things that I write about. But if you practice what you are reading, you can do the whole lot. So make friends with your subconscious. Give him or her a name, and be sure that you keep that name very, very private indeed. You can talk to your subconscious. It is better if you talk slowly and repeat things. Imagine that you are telephoning someone on the other side of the world and the telephone line is a bit poor, you have to repeat yourself, you have quite a difficult time making yourself understood. Your listener at the other end of the telephone line is not an idiot for having difficulty in understanding your message, but general communications are bad, and if you overcome the difficulties of communications you can then find that you have a very intelligent conversationalist, one who is far more intelligent than you are. When you are using the pendulum, we will go into that in more detail in a moment or so, you have to keep your feet flat on the ground so that the balls of your feet are in contact with the floor, and then you have to say something like, subconscious, or the name you have chosen, I want to know what I must do to get success at such and such a thing. If you are going to make the pendulum work, will you make it swing backwards and forwards to indicate yes, and from side to side to indicate no just as a human does when he nods for yes and shakes his head for no. You have to get over a message like that about three times, you have to explain very slowly, very clearly, and very carefully indeed what you want your subconscious to do and what you expect of the test because if you don't know what you want, then how can the subconscious give you any information? The subconscious won't know either. If you don't know what you want, you don't know when you've found it. We started with dowsing, so let us deal first with what we call the dowsing pendulum. By the way, a little digression. Shall we refer to all subconsciousness as George for the purpose of this instruction? It's such a chore typing out subconscious time after time, so we will just use the generic name of George in the same way as pilots call their automatic pilot Mike. So George it is for our collective subconscious. 17 The dowsing pendulum should be a ball possibly an inch or an inch and a quarter in diameter. If you can get a very good wooden pendulum so much the better, or you may be able to obtain a neutral metal one. But for the moment any pendulum will do as long as it is about an inch or an inch and a quarter in diameter. You should get a piece of thread such as bootmakers use for stitching on soles. I believe it's called cobbler's thread. 
you will need about 5 feet of it. Tie one end to your pendulum which should have a little eyelet on the top for that purpose, and tie the other end to a rod or even to an empty cotton reel. Then wind all the thread onto the cotton reel so that when you hold the small cotton reel in the palm of your hand the thread holding the pendulum is between the finger and thumb of your right hand your right hand if you write with that one, but if you use your left hand instead, then, of course, the pendulum will be in the left hand. But first we have to sensitize or tune our pendulum for the particular type of material we wish to locate. Supposing we are going to look for a gold mine, first of all you get a little piece of sticky tape, about an inch long is sufficient, and then you put just a very small piece of gold, scraped from inside a ring, for instance, onto the sticky tape and then just lightly push it onto the pendulum. Then your pendulum has a piece of gold which will sensitize it to that metal, and when I say scrape I mean that even if you get a grain, that will be adequate. When you have that, put your ring, or another piece of gold, between your feet as you stand up. Stand with this gold, such as a gold ring or a gold watch, between your feet and slowly unwind the thread so that your pendulum lowers to perhaps a foot and a half from your fingers. At this point the pendulum should swing in a circular direction, that is, making a complete circle. If it does not do so, lower the thread a little or pull it up a little, the point being you have to ascertain the length of thread at which the pendulum swings most freely for gold. When you have determined that it may be 18 or 20 or 22 inches or similar you make a knot in the thread and you write down the exact length, such as knot 1 gold, and then you pull off your gold specimen with the cello tape and pick up your watch or ring, and put a silver 18 article on the floor, it may be a coin or a piece of silver you have pinched from somebody else, but it must be silver. You also put a very fine scraping of silver on another piece of cello tape and put that onto your pendulum. Then you try again to find what is the correct length for silver. When you have done that you make another note such as not too silver. You can go on doing it for different metals, and not only different metals but different substances. If you make a proper table, then you should have great fun prospecting. Generally you will find that in terms of length the first thing to respond, at about 12 inches in length, is stonework. A bit longer thread, and you will get glass or chinaware. Longer still and you will get vegetable stuff. Go on increasing the length and you will get silver and lead, and then a bit further on you will find water. Longer still, you will find gold. Still longer, copper and brass. And the longest will be iron, and iron will be roughly just under 30 inches. So if you want to know what is beneath you, you just stand there and first of all think of whatever metal you are looking for. You adjust the length of your thread to the appropriate distance, and you very slowly walk forward. Again again it is emphasized and re-emphasized that you must tell George precisely what you are doing. You have to tell him that you want to prospect for gold, iron, silver, or whatever it is, and when he senses the radiations will he please swing the pendulum. At all times you must definitely keep thinking very strongly of that which you hope to find, otherwise, if you change over and think of something else, then you won't get it. Apropos of this let me say that if you are looking for antique porcelain, for instance, and you suddenly think of women, then you will get the reaction for gold because the length of thread for gold and for women is precisely the same, and if a woman thinks about men she will get the reaction as if there was a diamond under the ground. That, of course, means that you will be completely misled. It would never do if you got the reaction for a diamond so you grabbed a shovel and pick and dug, but found instead a dead man. It could happen. Now, it is advisable to use a shorter cord pendulum for 19 everyday indoor use. After all, you don't want 3, 4, or 5 feet of thread getting tangled up every day. So when you are indoors use a separate pendulum. The pendulums which can be obtained commercially already have a thread or a chain attached to them, and frequently the chain is possibly 6 inches long, although the exact length varies, but that is of no moment. Suppose you want to find something suppose you want to find out if a person is living in a certain area, then you sit down at a desk or table, but it must be an ordinary desk or table with no drawers or anything beneath because if you have anything beneath in, for example, 
a drawer, then the pendulum will be influenced by whatever is in the drawer. You may have a kitchen knife in the drawer. You may have a gold ring or something like that, and the pendulum, no matter how hard you think, will be influenced by the wrong subject. So sit at a plain table and have within arm's reach some sheets of ordinary plain white paper. Then you tell your pendulum, or rather you tell George exactly what you want. You say, for example, look, George, I want to find if Maria Bugs Bottom lives in this area. If she does will you please nod by giving the pendulum a backwards and forwards movement, and if she does not will you please shake the pendulum from side to side. Then on the right hand side of the table you have your piece of white paper, and on the top which is far away from you, you put yes, and on the bottom which is close to you, you put yes. On the far left side of the paper you put no and on the far right side you put no, and in the center you put a little X to show that is the spot over which you are going to hold the pendulum. The pendulum, by the way, should be held about 2 inches above that X sit comfortably. It doesn't matter if you have your shoes on or your shoes off, but you must have your feet on the floor, not on the bars of a chair have them flat on the floor so that the balls of your feet are in contact with the floor. Then you get a map of the area desired and spread it to your left so that you have a white sheet of paper to the right and your map on the left. First you gently take the pendulum all over the area of the map, saying, Look, George, this is the area of my map. Is 20 Maria Bugs Bottom anywhere within this area? The pendulum is being taken over the map about 2 inches above the surface. When you have covered the whole area, you say, George. I am now going to start this investigation. Will you help me, George? Will you indicate yes or no as the case may be? Then, if you are right-handed, put your right elbow comfortably on the table and suspend your pendulum by its thread or chain, hold the thread or chain between your thumb and forefinger, the finger with which you point. See that the pendulum is about 2 inches above the X special note here if you are left-handed everything will have to be reversed but for the right-handed people in the majority well, go by the instructions conveyed above. Having got ready, and making sure that you are not likely to be disturbed, tell George that you are now ready to start work. Look at the map and put your left forefinger along the road on the map where you think Maria Bugs Bottom may be living. Give an occasional glance at the pendulum. It may swing idly without any apparent sense, but if you get to where you believe your friend or enemy is living, then the pendulum will definitely indicate yet or nay. It is a good idea to use a small scale map first so that you can cover the biggest area, but when you get some sort of indication as if George was saying, gee, this is a big area, I need to get closer than this, then you get a large scale map so that you can with practice locate any individual house. After each test you definitely must replace your sheet of white paper by another O, you can use it for writing on, write letters on it or anything else, but only one sheet of white paper to one reading because you have impregnated that sheet with the impressions of whatever you are trying to find out so that if you try to repeat a reading, then the second reading will be influenced by the first and well, that's all there is to it. But no, perhaps that's not all there is to it after all because you've got to really frame your questions properly. George, you see, is a single-minded individual who can't take a joke and is extremely and exceptionally literal. So it's no good you saying, George, can you tell me if Maria Bugs Bottom lives there? If you ask a question like that the answer will be yes, 21 because George can tell you if Maria Bugs Bottom lives there, he can. And that is what you are asking. You are asking with a question in that form if the pendulum can tell you. You are not asking if she is actually living there at the moment. So whatever question you ask must be framed in such a way that George is not in a state of confusion. The biggest difficulty about the whole affair is framing the questions so that they are foolproof, so that there are no double meanings to them. In any question if you say, can you tell me, then the answer will be yes or no to the question of can you tell me. The other part of the question, if Maria Bugs Bottom lives there, will be unanswered because the first question will have swamped George's interest. 
So until you are more practiced at this how about writing out your questions first and looking at your words to see if there is any way at all in which the question can be regarded as ambiguous or as having a double meaning or is unclear. Let me repeat in big, bold, black capitals you must be sure of what you are asking before you can pose the question. Of course, when you have some practice it's quite easy to trace missing people. You have to have a small scale and a large scale map of the area in which the person is supposed to be missing. Then you have to be able to form some sort of mental picture of the person who is missing. Is it a big boy or a small girl? Is he or she ginger, blonde, or black haired? What do you know about the person? You have to brief yourself as fully as possible, because, again, unless you know what you are seeking, then you don't know when you've found it. It may happen at times when, for example, you are confined to bed, that you cannot stick your feet plunk on the ground. That is my trouble, so I have a metal wand about two and a half feet long, and I hold that in my left hand just like an antennae system to a portable radio, in fact that's what it is, it is an antenna rod from a portable radio. I pick up the wave from that in precisely the same manner as a more mobile person would with two flat feet. When I am picking up impressions from a map or a letter, then I use a little propelling pencil, a metal one, and I touch 22 the letter or the map and then the old pendulum starts to wobble and gives me an answer. Never, never, never let anyone else touch your pendulum. It's got to be saturated with your own impressions. You should have several pendulums, one of wood, one of neutral metal, that is something like type metal, and well, you may want a glass one or you may want a plastic one, you may even have one which is hollow so you can put a specimen inside instead of sticking it up with cellotape. But you will find one pendulum is more responsive than all the others for personal things, and you can make it even more responsive by carrying it on your person, getting it saturated with your own impressions. If you do that and never let another person use it or even touch it, then you will find you have something as potent and as useful as radar is to aircraft on a foggy night. The pendulum cannot be wrong. George cannot be wrong. You can. You can go wrong with the form your questions take and your interpretations of the answers. Now, with computers one has to use a special language, otherwise the computer cannot make sense of what one is trying to get at, so pretend that your pendulum is a computer and frame your questions in such a clear one-way form that no possibility of error can occur because the pendulum can only indicate yes or no. It can indicate uncertainty by doing a figure of eight. It can also indicate what sex a thing or a person is because most times for a man it can rotate in a right-hand circle, clockwise that is, but for a woman it will rotate in a left-hand, anti-clockwise, circle. But if the man is very feminine then the poor old pendulum may go the wrong way, but it's not actually the wrong way, it is just indicating that the man isn't he's more female and just has the necessary attachments, as one would say in the best circles, which would enable him to pass physiologically as a male specimen. All his thoughts may be female, so in that way the pendulum is far better as a judge than the best doctors. Oh yes, I must be sure to tell you this. Make sure your hands are clean before using the pendulum, otherwise, if, for instance, you have been gardening or stubbing out a cigarette butt in some poor plant's plant pot home, then you will get a reading for the soil content of the pores of your fingers. So be 23 sure that your fingers and hands are clean. Be sure that your table is clean. It's no good, for instance, turning around and finding that a big fat cat is sitting on a sheet of white paper, and if it is then you have to use a different sheet of white paper. With a pendulum and practice you can know how to douse for minerals from a map. You go along looking for gold, if you like by having a little particle of gold attached to the pendulum. Then you let your finger go along the map to the location where you think there may be gold, and you think strongly of gold to the exclusion of all else. Or, if you are looking for silver, think strongly of silver to the exclusion of all else. All these things are very, very simple, until you get used to them you will be sure they are utterly impossible they are not for you. But they are. It is only practice that makes a pilot able to take off in his aircraft and bring it down in one piece. 
it is only practice and faith in yourself that will enable you to go to your table, produce a map and a pendulum, and say, there there is water, floods of it, and then go to the actual site and find upon digging that the water is at a certain depth. You can get a good idea of the depth of a thing by the strength of the oscillation or movement of the pendulum. This is not a book on pendulums or dowsing, but practice will soon teach you how to shorten or lengthen the chain or string, and how to gauge depth. But remember again that you must very definitely and strongly concentrate on that which you want to find or know. You can also find out a lot about a person by using a pendulum over the signature on the letter. It is quite a useful exercise. But, remember, you must be sure of what you want to know, you must be sure of what you are asking, because if you are asking a thing in two parts then George is sure to answer the wrong one. And be very certain that you tell your subconscious George or whatever you call him or her precisely what you are trying to find out and what you expect the pendulum to do to indicate the information you desire. Since writing the above I have tried it on the dog because it seemed clear enough to me, but then I know it all, so I got someone who did not know it all to read it and now I am going to give some supplementary information 24 well, how does one hold this pendulum? One rests one's elbow on the table, as already stated, and it should be the right elbow for a right-handed person and the left elbow for a left-handed person. Then you bend your arm so that your hand is at such a height from the table that your pendulum, which is suspended at the end of its chain, rests about two inches above the surface of the table. You actually hold the chain, string, cord, or whatever it is between your thumb and forefinger, and if you want to shorten the chain an inch or so in order to get a better swing well, do so. Always adjust the length of the chain or thread between your finger and thumb so as to get the best swing or indication. Now, that should be clear enough you just hold your forearm at such an angle that you are comfortable. You must be comfortable or you will not be able to do pendulum work. Similarly, if you have just had a heavy meal you will not be able to do pendulum work, or if you have something bothering you greatly unconnected with this pendulum, it will distract your attention. You must be in a fairly quiet state of mind, and you must be willing to work with the subconscious. Now, I am also told, you've got me all confused, you say the overself is going to vary the current well, what is the connection between the overself and the subconscious? Let us try to get this clear forever and a day or a bit longer, there is you who is just one tenth conscious. You are bottom man on the ladder, or you might even be bottom woman on the ladder. Above you, you have your subconscious, and your subconscious is like the operator who controls the switchboard, etc., which is your brain. The subconscious is in touch with you through your brain through your joint brain would perhaps be a better term and the subconscious is also in touch with your over self. So it's like you, the ordinary poor worker, who cannot get a word with the manager, you have to go through the shop steward or the foreman first. So you sort of hang around. Try to make yourself obtrusive in the hope that the shop steward or the one above you will notice you, and wondering why the, you know what, you are not at work will come and see what it's all about. Then you have to get your point of view over to the shop steward or foreman, and per 25 swayed him to take up your case with the manager or whoever is above him. This is similar to conditions with the overself and you. Before you can get through to your overself you have to enlist the aid of your subconscious, and once you can convince your subconscious that it's really necessary for your joint good, then the subconscious will contact the overself and the pendulum will be varied according to the indications which you are perceiving. Incidentally, if you can get through to your overself by way of the subconscious you can cure a lot of illnesses which you may have. The overself is like the president of a company and he doesn't always know what minor ailments affect the lower departments. He knows it in times when conditions are very very serious, but often he is in complete ignorance of some grievance which the lower order of workers have. But if you can get your shop steward to take up the matter with the overself, or president, or general manager, then a grievance can be settled before it becomes serious. So if you have a persistent ache here, there, or somewhere else, then keep on at George or Georgina, say clearly what the trouble is, what is this pain, what does it feel like, why do you have it, and will the subconscious please see that you are cured? 
the over-self is the unapproachable. The subconscious is the link between you, the one-tenth conscious, and the over-self which is all conscious. Oh sure, of course the pendulum can help you pick the winner of a race if you phrase your question sensibly, but look at, this can you tell me who will win the 230 race. Now what sort of a question is that? Look at it seriously and you will see that you are asking your subconscious to tell you this, can you, subconscious, tell me who will win the race? The answer, of course, would be yes, and if you get a yes in answer to your question, you would think you were being fooled, wouldn't you? You can't do it that way at all. Read back a bit to where I tell you how to locate things on a map. Now, in this case if you want to know who is going to win a certain race you will have to get a list of horses, the horses who are going to run in that specific race, and you will 26 have to think definitely, will this horse win? And you will have to bring the pencil in your left hand slowly down to each name in turn, leaving it there about 30 seconds and thinking about that horse for about 30 seconds, asking if this horse will win the race. If the answer is no, then go on to the next horse until you've got to the one that is going to win. You can do it with practice. It's not very moral, you know, because betting and gambling are bad things, but anyway that is your own responsibility. I am just trying to make absolutely clear to you that you won't get any satisfactory result unless you quite definitely phrase your question in such a manner that there is only one question involved, a question which can be answered by a plain yes or a plain no. I suggest you read that bit again because otherwise you are going to be really cross when you get a mixed up answer which really will be a mixed up questioner. The last question here is, yes, but where do I buy these pendulums? Actually they are fairly difficult to obtain because so many quick money operators are out to make a fast buck and they are selling absolute junk, little things like keychain ornaments which they swear is a pendulum with your birthstone attached or something. But that is utterly useless. I am going to persuade Mr. Souter to stock really reputable pendulums of a special type. There will be wooden ones and there will be neutral metal ones, and the metal ones will also have a recess or opening so one can place a specimen inside, such as a piece of hair picked up from a missing person's hairbrush or something like that. In that way the missing person can be missing no longer. Mr. Souter of Touchstones of England will also be able to supply you with books. I will give you his address later, at the end of this chapter. But I do repeat again that it is utterly useless to buy a cheap little junk affair which is just a gimmick to get money out of your reluctant pocket. If you want a thing you have to pay for it, and a worthwhile pendulum will cost anything from $15 to $30, let's say in English terms from 5 to 10 pounds. But you would pay that willingly for a small transistor radio, and a good pendulum is by 27 far more useful to you than the aforementioned transistor radio. With a pendulum you can find a fortune if you read this chapter properly and if you do really seriously practice. Practice is the key to everything. You cannot be a great pianist unless you practice. The more important the pianist the more he or she practices hours a day of those silly scales going bonk, bonk, bonk. It is the same with a pendulum, you have to practice and practice and practice so you can do it by instinct, and you can practice with people's letters, with medals, and all the rest of it, and that's the way you will make a success practice. Oh yes. There is one other little point which I should mention. I will mention it but, literally, I would expect that the ordinary rules of politeness would apply, it is very, very important indeed that after you have used your pendulum you clasp it in your two hands to your forehead and then you solemnly thank George or Georgina for assisting you in this reading. Thank you three times, do not forget that because if you do not thank him or her according to the elementary rules of politeness you may not get a response in two or three times hence, and remember, your thanks must be repeated thrice just as your requests have been. I am informed that there is some slight ambiguity in one part of this chapter, probably the whole thing is ambiguous but let's not dig up that problem. I am told that I do not make it clear how some poor wretch should stand when he or she is tuning the pendulum with a lump of gold or a crummy bit of silver between the feet. Okay, here it is again you get your gold, silver, tin, lead or copper and you put it on the ground between your feet. 
Then you stand upright with your spine straight and your left arm down by your side. Then you elevate your right hand so that your forearm is parallel to the ground and you see if that is a convenient method of doing it because if you brace your right elbow against your side you will not get undesired wobbles or squiggles in your pendulum but only what George dictates. But the main thing, of course, is hold your arm at any distance convenient for you and convenient for the pendulum. And that's all there is to it. 28 You may obtain pendulums, books, and other supplies from, Mr. E. Z. Souter, Touchstones Limited, 33, Ashby Road, Loughborough, Leicestershire, England. 29 Chapter 2 Chill Blew the Wind. Icicles formed and hardened on projecting stonework. A skirl of dust around the concrete pillars, and the wind moaned off along the covered ways, keening a dirge to the departed summer. In the waterway named Biker's Dyke Roaring Icebreakers heaved and groaned. I think you all get the knowledge what you are looking for. I think you have all the knowledge about the pendulum and how to use it to find answers for your, to your relevant questions. On the middle of this video, I had some added some videos about uh, treasure hunting methods. A person who's dowsing using a dowsing rod, it's a man-made dowser that can be bought from the internet on nowadays. It's make uh, applying pure gold to that uh, metal thing and then they try to use that dowser to find hidden treasures in trucks and other places. On this method, as that method also you can use the pendulum that has mentioned as the Lord of Sarampa on history teaching you can use the pendulum to find treasures and if you need to find a missing person you can also use the pendulum i think this will be helpful to you all what i had share with you all and i think uh, i did the correct thing to share my knowledge with you all thank you and if you are interested in more in dowsing and other things about to be a light worker if you want to be a light worker please follow the book set of the Robsai Rampa it will explain all the ancient method of using uh, your mind body spiritual uh, spiritual techniques and other all the things if you want to be a light worker the Lopsavge Rampa show the way how to be a light worker. He explains what are the how to beginning what is the beginning of the world, how it ends, and also all about thinking in his set of books. Thank you again. I'm thank you. I hope I will this video will helpful to your life. That what I have share with you. Uh, that's it. You know. Thank you, everyone. See you again in a. Another video that helpful to you all.